I think we say that statement very flippantly, but if we understood the weight of that, we would say it differently. We wouldn't say, man, don't worry about that. Nobody's perfect. We would say, oh my God, nobody's perfect. And what that means is that no one will see God. We've heard it said that God does not call us to be perfect. In fact, it's the total opposite. Jesus tells us to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That's what he calls us to do. And if we as imperfect people were to stand before an almighty God, imperfect, we would all tremble. We would all probably just disintegrate before an all-powerful God. The only way to see God is to be made perfect, or I'm going to use the word today, to be made holy. To be set apart by God, to be made perfect by God for his use so that we could one day be with God forever. And God takes this very seriously. He wants every single one of you to be holy. He wants us to be perfected. Understand, when we say holy, we're saying sacred. God wants us to be sacred, perfect, holy. If you don't believe me, well, just write this down in, in your notes to look up later. I'm going to put the words up on the screen. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says this. Strive for peace with everyone and for the, and for the holiness without which no one will see God. You have to be holy. In Hebrews 12, 14, it tells us that it says no unclean thing. No unclean thing, nothing that defiles or is defiled shall ever be brought into the glorious presence of a holy God. We must be holy. We must be set apart. You know, we say words like, terms like holy Bible. We don't realize what we're saying, but we're saying that that book is set apart from every other book. We say Holy Spirit. We're saying that the spirit of God is set apart from the spirit of man. There's something different to it. Holy people are set apart for the work of God. The holy cross was not just another criminal dying. It was set apart for Christ, our Savior, to become sin for us. I believe that the more man realizes how holy, how set apart God is, the more man will tremble. In fact, I realize that in my life, that as I grow in my walk with the Lord, the more I realize how awesome he is and how much I am not. I am not. The, prop, the prophet Habakkuk had an encounter with God. And in that encounter, he says this in his account. My lips quivered. My belly trembled. And rottenness entered my bones. Before a holy God, he was like, God, I am undone. He kind of shared in different words what the prophet Isaiah said in chapter 6 when he saw the throne room of God in his glory. And he says, woe is me. Woe is me. I am undone. I am ruined. And our passage today in Exodus 30 shows us how holy God is. In all the things that he instituted for his people to follow. They've been freed from being slaves for a period of time now. Possibly even more than a year. And they find themselves at the foot of a mountain named Mount Sinai. It's where in Exodus 20, Moses received the Ten Commandments. And now Moses finds himself up at the top of that hill again. With the people waiting at the foot to hear from Moses. Which meant they would hear from God. Moses was experiencing the glory of God. So much so, one, one account says that Moses' face shined so brightly coming down off that mountain that they had to put a veil over his face because of the glow that was coming from him. In Exodus chapter 30 and 31, that's our goal today, you're going to see six commands that God says for us to, to, to fulfill and to make us holy. We could call them Holy commands. And in the first one, 
In Exodus chapter 30, verses 1 through 10, we have holy prayers. Holy prayers. You see, in Exodus chapter 30, verses 1 through 10, we read about an altar of gold. And this altar was not like the altar outside of their temple where they would offer sacrifices of lambs and bulls and goats to pay the price for their sins. This was not a bronze altar. It was a gold altar. And as you got closer and closer to that third part of the temple, the Holy of Holies, which, is, which was said that the presence of Almighty God was, it would shift from bronze to silver to gold. Increasing in holiness and set-apartness, increasing in glory. Where was this altar of incense placed? It was placed right before the last veil. Right before you entered into the most holy place where it was said that God's presence dwelled. Now, why is this important? That altar was, it was, was where you would offer incense to God and the aroma was said it was, was a sweet smell to God. In verses in verses 7 and 8, it tells us that those, that incense was to be burned every morning and every evening. Verse 6 tells us the location right before the veil. If you keep reading in that passage on your own time, you'll notice that there's only a certain kind of incense that can be offered. Not, not any kind. It, it call, they, call it if, they call it unauthorized incense. If, if this unauthorized incense was placed there, the person would be killed. That's how serious and how holy our God was. But why did I title this point holy prayer and not holy incense? Well, one is because I'm going to use all the letters P today. And it, wouldn't, it would mess up that whole thing. But it's a little bit deeper than that. Because throughout Scripture, incense is symbolic for prayer. Understand that when the incense would rise right before the veil, they had it there for a reason, symbolizing the prayers of God's people. Let me give you a passage in Psalm 141. Just kind of bear with me. I'm going to go through a few of them here pretty quickly. Psalm 141, verses 1 and 2 says, O Lord, I call upon you. Hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call you. Here's the key. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. You see them put right next to each other. Let my prayers be like incense. Let my prayers rise up to you and be a sweet, sweet smell to your throne that you would hear, that you would engage with my prayers. But not only that, in one passage in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, it doesn't say incense is like prayer. It says incense is prayer. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 says this. Towards the end of the time, it says, And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, this is a vision that John had, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Watch this. Each holding a harp, a golden and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Incense, symbolic of prayer. And when we pray, our prayers go up to that throne room where God is. There's no mistake that the altar of incense was right before that veil where the throne of God was. But there's much greater news than just that God may hear our prayers. Beloved Christian, God hears your prayers. Amen. He hears you when you cry out to him. Because there is no veil for us in between the altar of incense and the throne room of God. The scripture tells us in the New Testament that when Jesus died, that the ground shook. That the sky turned dark. And that that veil that we're talking about in that, in that tabernacle, which was the temple of the time of Christ... Tore from top to bottom, symbolizing that God was now with man and needed no other priest but Christ Amen. to offer a sacrifice for you and for me. So now we can, as the scripture says, boldly approach the throne of grace. 
You need not some more godly man than you to offer that incense. You get on your knees today and pray. Today you can offer that incense as a priest in God's family because of what Christ did. I love what this old confession says in church history. It's called the Belgic Confession. And it says this. These are people long time dead, over a thousand years old, and knew this about our Savior. It says this, quote, But this mediator, Jesus, whom the Father has appointed between himself and us, ought not terrify us by his greatness. So that we have to look for one another according to our fancy. Here's the key. For neither in heaven nor among the creatures on earth is there anyone who loves us more than Jesus Christ does. That high priest was so set apart and so holy he could have had nothing to do with you and it would have been totally okay. But he loves you. He loves you more than anything else in this world. And we know that God loves us. We know, beloved, that God loves us because he paid the penalty for the death that we deserve for our sin on that beloved cross. We know that he loved us. It wasn't like he was waiting for you to ask him out. He took the first step and knocked on your door and laid his life down so that now, the penalty that you would owed for your sin could be paid. Amen. Which brings us to the next commandment, number two. The holy payment. The holy payment. I'm doing my best with these two chapters, guys, to try to get you to remember what's happening because there's a lot of things that we could just fly right over. But make no mistake about it, everything applies to us today. Everything we're reading applies. It's just when we have Jesus, we see it through the right lenses. Where now we're not having to bring a goat to church and offer it. Because we have our great high priest. That's right. We see a holy payment in what your, your Bible is probably calling the title, the census tax. It was a census tax. What they were doing, well, let's look at verse 12. Read it with me. Exodus 30, verse 12. It says, when you take the census of the people of Israel... Then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. The census was simply to, to take account of the people. They were much smaller than the United States of America, and we do it every 10 years or so. We take a census to figure out more or less who's with us, who do we have, what kind of people we have, what age and what ethnicity and all of these things. They wanted to know who was with us. For many reasons, but just we're not going to go that far today. Just understand there was a census tax. We wanted to know who was with us and who was who. How much would they pay? How much did they have to pay? Look what it says in verse, 10, verse 13. Each one who is numbered in the census shall give this, a half shekel. According to the shekel of the sanctuary, the shekel is 20 geras, half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. We know that to be about eight grams of silver, which would equal about five dollars. But we can't really say how much silver was worth then. So we don't know how much exactly it was. But there are some things that we do know. Look what it says in verse 14. Who was asked to pay this census? Everyone who is numbered in the census from 20 years old and upward shall give the Lord's offering. So you had to be 20 years and above, which was military age, and it was military age for men. Because it says 20 years old, we know they probably didn't ask the women or the children to pay, but men, military age, 20 years old and above, which gives us insight as to why they wanted the census. How many men do we have fighting when we go to war? We need to know this. And what I love about this passage is it doesn't go by percentage, because there's something deeper to this census tax than just us providing for the tabernacle, for, the, for where they met God. Every single person, 20 years and above, every male, 20 years and above, was called to pay the same thing, a half shekel. Now, how was the census a holy payment? No one likes taxes, right? And for some of you, Uncle Sam's coming. Because April is coming and some of you are due. 
So you better get that right. But this is unlike just a regular tax. There's a huge phrase in verse 12 we can't miss. And it makes it bigger than just a tax. Look what it says in verse 12. It says, when you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life. In other words, what he was asking for was a payment so that they would not die. You keep reading, it says, if you don't pay this, then you better be careful that lest the plague might fall upon you. Well, doesn't that sound like he's fear-mongering? Like, saying, man, you better pay or else God's going to kill you. But he wasn't fear-mongering. He was telling them the truth. God is a holy God, and he expected people to do this, not, just because, not because he needed the money, but because he wanted to care for the people, Aaron and the Levites, that were taking care of the temple, and because he was telling us something much greater, which we know and see through Christ. You see, Jesus was the ransom. He was the payment for our life. So that today we don't have to worry about a plague coming your way. Man, don't you know I had a guy come to my house. He was doing work at my house and he told me before he left that he was a prophet. And that if I didn't do what he was telling me to do, that something really bad was going to happen to me. Don't you know that if something happened a week from then and something bad happened, he might have been, I told you so. But by God's grace, he spared me so far. But that messed with me, man. That really did mess with me because now, if anything bad happened, I'd be thinking, dude, it's, it's happening. It's happening. And we're not called to live in that fear. Amen. That spirit of fear hasn't been given to us as believers. The only thing we fear is God. Amen. The only one we fear is God. But then, it was a scary thing if you did not follow. Truth is, today, it still is scary. But if you have Jesus... You no longer just have a God that can kill you. You have a father that can kill you. And if God is a good God and a good father, he knows how to reward his children. Think about it like this. If they did not pay this census tax, think about it. They would have had no representation in the offerings. They could not build the temple. That was for a few people. They could not offer the sacrifices that was left for Aaron and his sons. They could not take care of the temple that was left for the Levites. So the one way that they could actually be bought in and be a part of the sacrifice is by giving a half shekel, a ransom for their life. And you know what that means? That means that when the priest offers the sacrifice, they are now a part of that sacrifice. They get to partake in it. So they're not just, just standing back on just, yeah, Jesus, do your thing. High priest, do your thing. Yeah, thank you for doing that. Now they have buy-in. Here is my census tax, and now I am a part of what's happening. Maybe the scripture's right when he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, some translations say, there your heart will follow. How many of you know that when we give to God, whether it's through the church or to other people, that you're the one that's being blessed the most. It's not the person receiving it. It's the person that's giving it. And some of you get nervous to ask people to serve God with you. Listen, you're hurting them. Ask people to give. Ask people to serve. They will be the biggest benefactors of this whole thing. Now, don't use this and abuse it. But if you really want people to grow, challenge them with those things. I love that they all had to pay the same amount of salvation just like us. What do we have to pay? Nothing. We have the free gift of salvation, not because salvation is free, but because Jesus paid the ransom. That's why it's free for us. Jesus says it like this in Mark 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He paid the price with his blood. And when you receive this gift of salvation by putting your trust in Jesus, 
you are cleansed. You are cleansed, which leads us to the third holy commandment. Number three is a holy pot. Not holy pot like Colorado holy pot. (laughs) A holy pot, a holy basin, okay, is what it was. And in this basin, they would put water. Where would they put this basin? Well, if you read in Exodus chapter 30 and on after your title where it says the holy basin, they would put it right at the entrance of the tabernacle, that tent where they would meet Jesus. And only Aaron and his sons would be able to wash and go in and out. You see, they needed to wash because the desert dirt was that symbolism of their sin, walking around in the wilderness. And God wanted none of that dust inside of his holy place. So they would go and wash their hands and wash their feet and enter into that holy place to offer sacrifice by washing their hands and feet with water. Now, there's two cleansings that happen in this passage. There's the initial cleansing, and then there's the continual cleansing, which all applies to us today. You see, when you put your trust in Jesus, family, you are initially washed, and now you can enter the throne of grace. Now you can be presented before God, not as unholy, but as holy. But even though we are perfectly holy in the spirit, doesn't your body want to do different things? Don't your eyes want to see things you shouldn't see? And and your mouth sometimes tastes things they shouldn't taste. And your hands do things that they should not do. Your body, your flesh that we're captive to on this planet will try to push you to do things that are unholy. Though your spirit is perfected in Jesus. We see this in this passage. The initial washing was to go in to that tabernacle. If you didn't wash, guess what would happen? Verses 20 and 21, you'd die. You would die before God. In Ezekiel chapter 36, it tells us this. It says, Israelites profane the name of the Lord, and God says yet that he will save them. This is how he says it in Ezekiel 26 verse 25. um, It says it like this. Just listen to these words. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. That's what he says. I will sprinkle clean water in you. I will cleanse you. How many of you know that Jesus is the only one that can wash away your sins? Jesus is the only one. He's the only one that can wash it away. You can't do it on your own. Some of you have been trying that for the last 30 years. It doesn't work. You're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You're too weak for the powers of the enemy. You need someone that can enter that tabernacle and offer the sacrifice on your place. You can't stand before God on your own. You needed someone. You needed that perfect someone, Jesus, to wash you and to cleanse you from all of your sin. You see, in our disobedience, we realize how sinful we are. And God has called us to many things that we still disobey in. But Jesus didn't disobey, family. Imagine for a moment history without Jesus. Just take him out of the picture. Take him out of the picture. Nothing happened in 0 to 6 AD. Nothing. What do we do? Are you from the tribes of Judah? Are you from the tribe of Benjamin? Are you from the lineage of these Israelites? If not, you might be damned to hell. But some people still made it by faith. Well, yeah, you have to live by faith, but you still have to keep the law even when you were inducted into the family. Offering sacrifices, living a certain way, couldn't do anything on this day, on that day, had to offer these kind of things and that kind of thing, and then the high priest had to do all this for you. And then we have to do it all again next year. We need it to be washed and cleansed. What about in your struggles? Hey, I don't know if you're anything like me, but man, there's some times in my life, I'm going to be honest with you, like, I feel unsaved. There's times in my life, man, like, when I examine the person that I am, and let's say I could be doing everything right, I know my heart is wicked, and it wants to do things against God. Or even worse, it wants to do good things for wrong reasons. 
yeah, I'm being nice to my wife, being good to my wife. Why am I doing that? Is it because I want something from her or is it because I want her to be mad at me? Or is it because I love her? Is it because God loves me? Man, I look at my life and I say, man, I could play the part well. But my heart still fights the things of God. It still fights it. I think of the words of the psalmist in Psalm 51. David had just committed adultery with Bathsheba. David had just killed Bathsheba's husband. And he says these words after these moments of struggle and sin. He says this, wash me from my iniquity. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Cleanse me from my sin. You ever say those words that David said? Just feel, man, God, I've sinned. Cleanse me. I want to tell you that that initial washing of Jesus has cleansed you. Your body, your flesh makes you feel unclean. But God sees you clean, family. I know that's crazy. I know that's crazy for you to think about with some of the things that, that, that you have, you know, you've done that you're not proud of, but God sees you clean. Now, I'm talking to people that have the spirit here, the people that have put their trust in Jesus. That's a whole other sermon as to whether you are or aren't. You know, some of you may not know the Lord. I'm not saying you're clean if, God, if you haven't put your trust in Jesus. But I'm saying, man, if God's changed your life, if he saved you, you're cleansed, totally cleansed. There's nothing more for you to do. Yet, though we are perfectly cleansed in the initial washing, our responsibility here on earth, guys, is to make this body and make this mind do what the spirit knows it's supposed to do. Amen. That's the battle. Getting this body and the mind to do what the spirit wants us to do, and that's where we see the continual washing. Will you read in your Bibles in Exodus 30, verse 20? Exodus 30, verse 20. It says this. When they go into the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, where they meet God, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash with water so that, may, so that they may not, not die. Anytime they would enter the presence of God, they would have to wash you know how 1 John says it? Look, like if you, don't, if you didn't catch anything of what I just said about being perfectly washed and still needing to be washed, 1 John says it exactly how you need to hear it today. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, listen to this. This is the summary of being washed perfectly and still needing to be washed. John, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 say, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. He doesn't want you to sin. He wants you to be perfect, right? We're not going to do it. But he wants you to live a righteous life. And he says this, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What he's saying is that I don't want you to sin. It's not like you got saved, so now you got to get out of hell free card and do whatever you want. You are saved now. If you do sin, you have an advocate. And praise God for that. Can someone say thank you, Lord, this morning? You, Lord. My God. Thank you. thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. And you know what makes us perfect above anything else? You know how we're cleansed with water? It's what Jesus told Nicodemus, by the way, in John chapter 3. I don't know if you remember that story, but Nicodemus was an old Jewish man, one of the wisest men in Israel. And Jesus tells him, you got to be born of water and spirit, which is actually the next thing we see in these holy commands. The fourth holy command, I, put, I wrote down here, the holy paraclete. What in the world is that? What is the paraclete? See, in, in church history, you would not just, you wouldn't say Holy Spirit. Actually, more often, you'd say the Holy Ghost. But in other writings, you'll see our paraclete, which means the one called by our side. The Holy Paraclete is the Holy Spirit. Not a pair of cleats, okay? The Paraclete. 
from the Greek word to be called by one side is what Jesus tells us in John 14 that I will send you a counselor greater than I, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Now, where do we see the Holy Spirit in our passage? We see it through anointing oil. You see, just like incense was paralleling prayers, oil was paralleling the spirit of Almighty God. Let's do some reading. Exodus chapter 30, 25 through 29. Exodus 30, 25 through 29. Look how holy God is, how set apart he is. Man, you'd have to do all this stuff to be in the presence of God. In 25, Exodus 30, 25 through 29 says this. And you shall make of these a sacred anointing oil blended by as by the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tent of meeting. And the ark of the testimony, and the, tab- and the table, and all its utensils, all of the furniture inside of that tabernacle, and the lampstand and its utensils, and, all- and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the basin and its stand, you shall consecrate them, that they may be the most holy. Whatever touches them will become holy. Did you catch what it was saying? It was saying that you have to take this oil that I'm going to have you make. It's, a, it's, an, it's like an anointing oil. It's going to smell a certain way, and you have to touch everything with it. And everything that the oil touches is considered holy, and now anything that touches that thing that the oil touches is made holy. That's what this oil was used for. And it wasn't just items. It wasn't just stuff that you had to touch with the oil. Look at the next verse, verse 30. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons. And consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. Now the oil is setting apart people. And you shall say to the people of Israel, This shall be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on the body of an ordinary person, and you shall make no other like it in composition. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Conclusion, verse 33, whoever compounds it, any like it, or whoever puts any of it on an outsider shall be cut off from his people. I know some of you, as you're reading it, you're saying, oh, yeah, that does sound like the Spirit. That does sound like the Spirit. Because it does represent the choosing of God. Psalm 89, verses 20 and 21. Listen, listen, it says in verse 20 and 21 of Psalm 89, I have found David, King David, my servant. With my holy oil, I have anointed him so that my hand shall be established with him. That anointing oil, it was setting things apart for the work of God. Kind of sounds like the word holy. Yeah, that's why we in the Catholic church you have what's called holy oil or holy water. It was blessed by someone that is said to have a greater relationship with God than others, and it makes it holy. But here we see it's that the oil made things holy anything it touched and any one it touched was made holy now of course it could only touch certain people and that's where it comes over to us it was meant only listen to my words here this is important this is getting to us it was meant only for chosen people and not just chosen people a chosen people from the chosen people Aaron and his family, namely priests, the people that could connect to God more than anyone else. Oh, I got to share this verse with you. Hey, I'm excited for this one. This is one of my favorite parts of the whole thing because I, I mean, when I read this, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, this verse is talking about you now, not Aaron and his sons, Okay. So much you this morning. First Peter 2 verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen race. A royal priesthood. About you it says that. A holy nation. A people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse 10, once you were not a people. You heard that? 
Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Translation, the chosen people, the royal priesthood that received the anointing oil, now you receive through the Spirit of God. Praise God for that. That he seals you, Ephesians 2, until the day of Christ Jesus. That he counsels you every day if you spend time with him in John 14, 6. That he intercedes for you. Every day when you pray. And then this one here. If you're not sold that oil means Holy Spirit, you got to see 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Look what it says, man. This is awesome. It says, and it is God who establishes us with you in Christ. Look at this. And has anointed us. Did you catch that? He could have used any other word. He uses the word anointing. He says, it's God who established us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. That's for you. Wretched sinner saved by grace. That's for you. That's for you this morning. You've been saved by Christ and anointed with the oil of the holy paraclete, the one that walks by your side. Now, remember, the one who walks by your side, he seals you unto the day of Christ Jesus. And we have all these laws about what to anoint and what to sacrifice and altars and bowls and tables and lampstands. Question, where the heck do we get these furniture items? Where do they come from? Do we just go down to the store and buy them? Like what do they do in the middle of the wilderness at the foot of Mount Sinai waiting for their leader to come down? What do we do with this? Well, Moses was getting this command, and God doesn't leave him hanging. He tells him how to get it, which brings us to this fifth holy command, which is holy partners. The command for two people in particular from all of Israel to become partners with God, workers to actually build these items. You know what their names were? Oliab and Bezalel. Try that. Oliab and Bezalel. Some of you might be having some babies coming on over. Hey, you got an option right there. Oliab and Bezalel. In Exodus 31 verses 1 through 11, it says they were skillful men. Skillful men. They could work with their hands. They were probably bronze smith or silver smith, gold smith. They were carpenters. Let me ask you a question. Could you imagine being chosen by God to work for him in this way? Over a million people in our community, and God said, those two, not only are they good at what they do, I'm going to give them an increased ability, and they will build everything in here. They will build the table, and they will build the bronze basin, and they will do all of these things for my glory. What a privilege. Hey, man, look, 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 look. I know some of us, man, we get lazy. I get it. Some of you don't want to work, but man, I see it as a privilege to work for God. I really do. Like, I would, I've been doing this right here since I was 20 years old. I'm 34 years old today, and I've done it part time, full time, all time. Whenever, even when there's no time, I'm going to preach the word, and not just in here, but wherever I go. God's changed my life so much that I see it just as the biggest privilege on all of planet earth to serve him in this capacity. Oh, Alex, I don't preach. So what? What do you do? How has God blessed you? What skills do you have? Use them for his glory. Every single one of us have been called to work for him. I just, I'm looking for the New Testament, Oliab, Oliab and Bezalel. Where are these men? Where are these men and women that would serve God, be chosen by him, and see it as a privilege? 
Guys, it's time for some of us to get in the game, man. You've been sitting way too long. You got to get in the game. What can I do? What can I do? You know you can do some things. Alex, I can, all I can do is pray. What you mean, all I can do is pray? The best thing you could do is pray. Devote 20 minutes an hour to pray. Devote it. Ain't that right, little man? Devote it. Devote him time to pray and, and do what God has called you to do. You know what people say? People say, man, people don't do things because people don't ask them. I'm asking. Serve God. Serve God. Not only does he call you to do that, I'm just saying as your brother in Christ, serve him. Oh, you just want to build some at church. No, I, actually, I could care less. Serve him at your workplace. That's where you spend most of your time. Serve them there. Talk to people about Christ there. Be kind to people there. Let people know that you're his followers by the way that you love one another and love even your enemies. Serve them there. Some of you have been talking about starting a family Bible study for a long time. Get home and do it. Serve him now. Open that book and just start reading it and get your family together and do that Bible study. Or maybe start loving your neighbors with those acts of kindness that you know you should have been doing a long time ago. Get in the game. He's called you to serve him. Some of us look at someone and say, man, but you guys don't offer, you know, what I'm good at. Then create it. Then do it. Yeah, but y'all don't go to Africa. Get your butt to Africa. God's called me there. Then go. But, but you don't have a small group for me. Start the small group. Oh, but but I, I want to do a Bible study on Revelation. Get your butt going. Start it. I, I don't know, I don't know if, I'm, if I'm sharp enough. Call me. That probably won't help much either. Call Bob. <laughs> we'll get you going. But for some of us, listen, if you're waiting for, the, for someone to ask you, I'm asking you, just get in there. And at worst, please, Actually, at best, please don't be a Monday night quarterback after the game is done and said, man, y'all could have done this. Or y'all should have done that. Help it. Help it. You've been given the Spirit of God to lead. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, after God tells us that we're saved by grace, that it's his goodness and not ours, in Ephesians 2, 10, you know what he tells us? For you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do the good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Some of you have the gift of prayer where you don't even have to come to any place. Just be at your home and devote time to God for the members of Summit Church to just flip through your membership directory and pray for the families that are here. Get in the game. Do what you can and do what you're called to do. I think what I see is too many Christians working hard for man, yet hardly working for God. On the flip side, there's some people that are plowing the field. Man, there are some people that say, you know what? My relationship isn't based on a church. My relationship with God isn't based on how much money I have or what's going on in my life. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to serve God every step of the way. You know what I say? Praise God. Praise God that God has moved in your heart in that way. And I'm just saying, I just want to encourage you this morning. Continue to be faithful. Even when you don't know what to do in your life and things seem to be falling apart, just continue to be faithful with what you know you're supposed to do. What's crazy in this passage here, if you go to Exodus 31 verse 11, in every single other command and thing that he's called us to do, there's a consequence if you don't do it. There might be a plague, you could be killed, you'd be cut off. You know what it says here in Exodus 30, verse 11? They will do it. There's no consequence because Oliab and Bezalel will get the job done. Church, maybe it's as simple as the evangelist Billy Graham said, quote, read the Bible, work hard and honestly, and don't complain. Maybe it's that simple. It's time to roll because God's going to roll with or without you. He's going to roll with or without me. And I see it as a privilege to be on the Jesus train. 
even though it's going and it's chugging along, man. Sometimes it's moving too fast. Get your butt on the caboose and just jump on there and start serving him in whatever capacity you want because he's going to work with or without, without us. The great uh, hymn writer Charles Wesley says this, God buries his workmen but carries on his work. Every one of us will die. One day we will be six feet under or cremated, whatever it is you're choosing to do, and we will be gone, and God will continue to work. I don't know about you. I don't want to be remembered for the stuff that I've possessed. I want to be remembered for someone that exalted Christ. Shoot, I wouldn't even mind not being remembered as long as Christ is Amen. because of my life. Amen. And I hope that would be the legacy that we aim for. The last one. Not only does God call us to work, God is such a good God, he doesn't leave us just to work our butt off seven days a week. Guess what he gives us? A holy pause. A holy Sabbath. He doesn't say work seven days, he says work six. Work six and rest on the Sabbath. Look what he says in verse 13. This is the last of the holy six holy commands he gives us in, this, in these two chapters. Verse 13, he says, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between you and me throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. Where do we get this from? Exodus 20. Okay, this is going to be very practical for you because I know we have, we've had questions about how do I keep the Sabbath holy? I've heard about the Bible that somewhere it says that you work six days and rest on the seventh, but I know that people take it very literal. Can I take a certain amount of steps that day? What if I actually do work that day? What happens? Here in our passage, it's telling us that it's going to be a sign for me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord and that sanctifies you. In fact, if you read at the bottom of our chapter in verse 31, if you don't, you'll be killed if you don't keep the Sabbath. How does this work for us? There's some churches today that worship God on Saturday morning and have their services on Saturday morning because they say that's the holy Sabbath of God. Why do we worship on Sunday and others worship on Saturday? What is the true Sabbath and how does it apply to us? We're closing with this because this is a teaching moment. And when God showed me this in his word, guys, it just, it, it, it moved so many things in my heart. And it helped me to apply this to my life and my family. Look, God wants workers to work. But he also wants workers rested. He wants rested people. I, I, I wish I could say what the preacher John Wesley says. He says this. Though I am always in haste, I am never in a hurry. Why? Because I never undertake more work than I can go through with perfect calmness and spirit. Some of us are working so much, you're giving 20% everywhere and not giving even 70% anywhere. Some say, easy for you to say you're not a mom. I'm telling you that the scripture tells us to rest. It tells us to rest. Are you resting? I can't. Okay, I'm just, once again, that's not with me. That's you and God. He's telling us to rest. Some would challenge, but is he telling us? We're not Israelites. We're people after Jesus that have been inducted into his family. So how does this work? He's, he's talking to the Israelites here and telling them to keep the Sabbath day holy. Well, First, it's important to know how serious he is about it. Look at verse 15. Exodus 31, verse 15. This is how serious God is about keeping one day holy, set apart for rest. Verse 15. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath shall be put to death. And it goes further. The Sabbath must still be kept today, is what he says. Verse 16. Therefore the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. Bear with me. Stay with me. This is gonna, I hope this helps you, especially as followers of Christ, that this helps you on how to keep a day of rest. Should we keep the Sabbath? Absolutely. 100% we should keep the Sabbath, but I want to break it down the way the scripture does into a literal day of rest and a spiritual day of rest. First, let's start with the literal day. It says in verse 16 that the Israelites should keep this covenant forever. They should have every seventh day 
of rest. So how do we literally observe it? I want to give you two, maybe three things of how to, con- how to consider a Sabbath day, a day of rest for you. First of all, we're not on a lunar calendar the way the Jews were. They would count days from sundown to sundown, not sunrise to sunrise. This causes a problem for many folks, in, particularly in the Seventh-day Adventist church, that consider the day Saturday as a holy day. Because if you follow Roman calendar, you're not following the Sabbath the way the Scripture teaches, which would be Jewish calendar, lunar day, sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. I want you today to consider taking a Sabbath sundown to sundown. So maybe some of you can't. I learned in my life that a Friday night to a Saturday night is actually much more helpful to me than a whole Saturday. Because on Saturday night, when my kids are, 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 are in bed, I can get up and start to work again. Some of you don't have a job like mine where it's sporadic and you can work all these crazy hours. I get it. But it does tell us to keep a day of rest. So consider that. Sundown to sundown as opposed to sunrise to sunrise. Okay? For those of you that are five-day-a-week five day work people, okay, five-day-a-week, 10 hours a day, or five-day-a-week, eight, 12 hours, somewhere around there, just a thought. If you have to work a sixth day, don't get mad. Don't get mad. God set, set that in his rules from the beginning of time. And sometimes you might be called in on a Saturday on your day off. Don't get so upset about it. Do it as unto the Lord. You're called to work six days anyways with the rest of on the seventh. For those of you that work seven days a week, listen, stop it. Stop it. You have to take some rest. Our work weeks are structure, structured in the United States in the Judeo Christian view. We, some, we used to work six days and rest on the, on the seventh. Um, there's some places that would shut down one day a week. We know one of them, don't we? Chick fil A. And why is it that every time you want Chick-fil-A, it's Sunday? <laughs> Sunday's the day you want Chick-fil-A. Did you hear the news? Did you hear the news? Some say, I'll believe it when I see it. But apparently a Chick-fil-A is coming down to Florida City. <laughs> Y'all haven't amen to one part of the whole sermon. <laughs> Y'all clap for Chick-fil-A. Yeah. Wow. I know where your heart is, people. (laughs) He says we're going to get that Chick-fil-A right behind the Puerto Tropical on US-1. Okay, we'll see what happens. People say, I'll believe it when I see it. But if the Lord be faithful and part the sea for us and give us holy chicken, we'll receive it. (laughs) Take a day of rest. Take some time of rest and work towards it. Some of you say, well, I don't know how to rest. Hey, man, I, I... I understand. It's hard. You know what happens for me when I stop my body moving physically? My brain just goes 100 miles an hour. Look at verse 17. This might help you. Verse 17. Speaking of the Sabbath rest, in Exodus 31, 17, it says, It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that the sixth day the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day, this is key, He rested and was refreshed. Did you hear what I said? He rested and was refreshed. You know what this means for us? Some of us need to take rest from physical labor. Some of you need to take rest from mental labor. And it looks different for every one of us. Am I the only one that actually enjoys doing yard work? Am I the only one? Is it a Mexican thing? (laughs) Okay, so about five of us. I enjoy it. And on my day of rest, what makes my brain stop is doing stuff like that. And so I don't know what the refreshing looks like for you. For some of you, it's being with people. Be refreshed with that. For many of us, it's not as getting away from everyone on planet Earth. Be refreshed with that. Do on the Sabbath what refreshes you so that we can embody the heart behind this day of rest. 
maybe Friday evening to Saturday evening, a bodily rest or a mental rest. But I say have a personal Sabbath. Pick a day out of the week, sundown to sundown, and be refreshed. But what if I have to call somebody? Or what if someone needs help? Hey, guess what? Jesus actually did that. There was a passage in Scripture, actually three of the Gospels, where Jesus and his disciples were out, and they picked heads of grain during the Sabbath. And the religious leaders, they go out and they say, who are these men that work on the Sabbath? And you know what Jesus tells them in the book of Mark? Oh, my gosh, this blows my mind. This is for you today. He tells us this, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You know what that's telling you? You're not a slave to that rest. If your friend needs help, oh, I'm taking the Sabbath. No, get your butt up and go help him. I, need, I, have, to get, I have to get this done. What, do you really have to get it done? If yet, go do it. Go do it. Because the Sabbath was made with you in mind, with you to rest. Family, you really think God needed to rest on the seventh day? You really think like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired, man. Those big cypress were really difficult. No. He rested for you. He rested for you. And I believe that God, when he t- just, on the seventh day, he just stepped back and said, wow, that's my creation. I did that. Just take a day to refresh. But here's the key through it all. You ready? We're going to close. I went a little long today. It's hard with two chapters. I want you to open your Bibles to Romans 14. Because I'm giving you the practicals for the literal day. But what if I told you that every day for a Christian is actually the Sabbath? Would that mess with you a little bit? That every day for a follower of Jesus is actually a Sabbath day? Romans chapter 14 This is a passage like if you have your hard copy Bible, you want to write on the side explanation of Sabbath day or Sabbath day, something like that on the side, Romans 14. What you have is a church with Jews that worship worship, on the Sabbath day they rest and Gentiles, people that are non-Jews that have no clue, you know, what the Sabbath day is. They both come to know Jesus. They both go to the same church. Now what happens? Look what it says, beginning in verse 5. I'm going to read all the way up to verse 12. This is so important. Romans 14, verse 5. It says this. One person esteems one day better than another, while another esteems all days alike. This is conclusion. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Do you take that day of rest? Be convinced in your mind. Do you not? Be convinced in your mind. Verse 6. The one who observes the day... Observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God. While the other one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died. And living again, that he might be the Lord, both of the dead and the living. What he's saying is you have some freedom here. Some regard one day higher than the other. Some regard all day as Lord's day. Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. This is for some of us that keep the Sabbath holy. Verse 10. Verse 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? You catch that? Why do you pass judgment? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written... As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me. Every tongue shall confess to God. Conclusion. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Translation, church. Whatever you do with that day of rest, do it as unto the Lord. That is what's non-negotiable. And it goes one step further in Hebrews. And this is why I tell you that we're in the Sabbath day today. Some of you need some rest, family. This is what the scripture tells us in Hebrews chapter 4. The words will be on the screen um, for you guys. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8. God's people are in the promised land, I mean, are in the wilderness. They got to get to the promised land, a day of rest. Look what it says. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest. Watch this. 
for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest, saved by Jesus, has also rested from his works as God did from him, from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Translation, today is God's Sabbath. And so is tomorrow. And so is the day after for all those that have put their trust in Jesus. Are you tired? Are you tired? Are you sick? Are you just ready for God to come back, man? Listen, today, focus on God. Give him some undivided time. Go for a walk. But just take some time and devote it to the Lord. And let's move more towards these days of rest so that we can physically and mentally be ready for the next day and also receive that one day we may have to break it. Break it, right? And go help someone in need because every single day is a day of rest. This was a hard two chapters because there's so much detail. But I hope today that you understand that all of it still applies to us but sometimes applies differently through Christ. And for that, we should be grateful. I hope and pray that for us as a church, man, that one day we would all be so focused on Christ, so focused on Christ that when people walk into this place, they would see Jesus. There would be no question about, man, what did I see today? That they would see Jesus. Jesus through his body. Quite frankly, guys, I, I see Jesus today. And for that, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Let's continue to strive to be more like him. Amen. We're going to collect our offering today. This is one of the ways that we worship God. This is not a census tax. You do not need to bring your silver or any of that. But the scripture tells us in the New Testament that each man must decide in his own heart what he should give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves, help me, a cheerful giver. giver. Let's give back because he's given to us first. Father, we um, are grateful for all that you do. I pray, Father, that we would um, just give back to you, Lord, um, from what we have and what you've entrusted to us. Lord, we take time um, to pray for those that are going to be going to the Bahamas, Father, in March. Um, And I pray, Father, for everyone that they encounter, that their hearts would be ready, Father, to receive uh, from you, that your gospel will go forward, and that people would also enter this rest that so many of us have. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.